Hi, this is Andy and Sharon McClellan from Father's House. Welcome to this teaching session. We pray that you will be blessed and grow as a result of listening today. Good to have you with us this morning. It is, and this morning we've got Andrew going to be sharing with us on Song of the Vineyard out of Isaiah 5. So, Father, we just bless Andrew this morning. Father, we bless the word of the Lord that it would go swift, it would hit the mark, it would do all that you desire to accomplish this morning. And we just bless Andrew with peace and sharpness of thought and mind and spirit that the Holy Spirit just rise upon him this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, bless you, Andrew. I'm going to drop off screen here and let you carry on. Yep, so pray that it'll go swift. That's good. I like that prayer. So, good welcome this morning. Um, I'm going to be talking about Isaiah 5. And it's not something I didn't really know what I was going to preach on, but then I had a quiet time and, and this passage came up. So I decided this must be what I should be talking about today. Song of the Vineyard. So I've got various graphics and things to go along as we go along. So I hope that will make it more interesting for you. Let's put the graphic up to start off with. Song of the Vineyard. There you go. There's uh, Isaiah. So there were so many avenues I could explore on the subject, but I think it, it could probably last for about four weeks worth of sermons if I did that. And there's so much that um, it could be said. So I've narrowed it down to three hours. So we've only got three hours today to absorb all the information. No, it's all right. Something with that long be four hours. Anyway, for example, uh, let's come back off there. Dunk. Okay. For example, the first mention of vineyards goes back to Noah after the flood, when the Bible says that Noah began to be a man of the soil and he planted a vineyard. And man of the soil comes from the same root as Adam, who God formed of, from the dust of the ground. So it comes from the same root as that. So we could have talked about that, couldn't we? We could have looked at what God said about the vineyard in Psalms 80 and the vast vineyards that were across Israel. Uh, we could have talked about when Jesus said, I am the vine and you are the branches. And interesting to note that when the Romans left Israel and they plundered everywhere, they took all the vines with them back to Rome. And they didn't get reintroduced until 2000 years later. So we could have talked about that. But today I'm just going to focus on Isaiah 5 and Matthew 21, 33, which is the parable of the tenants. So Isaiah 5. Five is basically a summary of the first four books of Isaiah, and I was reading through that through those books as well, and really discovered how far Israel had fallen away from God's plans for for His nation, and for the nation of Israel, for His for His children, and it it's a basically a song from God's point of view delivered by Isaiah. And I was thinking about this passage, and I was thinking about um, love songs and and songs of unrequited love and I happen to think about what about Adele so I want you to consider a lot of these lyric, song lyrics in regard to speaking to us today because I, I feel that this actually kind of parallels quite a lot of uh, Isaiah number five uh, Isaiah five, number five Isaiah five so so I just want you to think about this from God's point of view and talking about Israel you know how the time flies only yesterday was the time of our lives. We were born and raised in the summer of haze, bound by the surprise of our glory days. I hate to turn up out of the blue, uninvited, but I couldn't stay away. I couldn't fight it. I'd hoped you'd have seen my face and that you'd be reminded for me it isn't over. So that's from Adele, never mind. The song, never mind. So it kind of like, if we think about how God wants us to see his face, to come close to him. And it's just the fact that they departed from him. And I just thought that's quite relevant. But the song which Isaiah delivers begins with God's love for his children and his chosen ones. It's a nation that he's set up specifically to be his people, to represent him in the world and to draw people back to him. And he, and he didn't spare any cost. He, he went to great expense and set up exactly how the nation should be and how it worked with him but unfortunately when he when he returns to get the harvest he discovers that the 
the grapes have gone, they're wild grapes, not ones that should have been planted. They're the people are not like they should have been. They actually stank. They were terrible. It wasn't anything like, it wasn't a crop you could, could drink from, wasn't a crop you could eat. They were just, they'd kind of gone off, I suppose. So if you want to turn to Isaiah number five, you number five, Isaiah five. Well, I keep saying number five. Anyway, Isaiah five, we'll go through that whole book. So let's start from the beginning. Um, and it says, I will sing for the one I love, a song about his vineyard. My loved one had a vineyard, a fertile hillside, and he dug it up and he cleared it of stones and he planted it with the choicest vines. He built a watchtower in it and cut out a wine press and well. As well, sorry. Didn't have a well, a wine press as well. So the vineyard represents the nation of Israel. It's a metaphor. He selects a fertile hillside that faces the sun, I guess, to get the maximum sunlight and to get the most growth. To have access to the, have access to the Father and look to him. I was thinking like it was like Israel was like a portal, I suppose, between God and man. And like Jake, like Jacob, Jacob experienced when he um, saw the angels ascending and descending. Israel was supposed to be a portal to the people. They, and for that, he faced them towards him. You know, he, he tried to get them to look towards him. Um, <clears throat> so the father prepares the ground. He cleared the stones. He planted the best vines. He put up a hedge of protection and he built a watchtower. To watch, to watch over the vineyard and guard it, to provide shelter and protection and place and place to store stuff and to stay in. And he built a wine press for the production of wine, wealth, power, and security. So that's the metaphor. Did this vineyard the vineyard established as how Israel was established? If we look back at their history and their inheritance, we can understand where God's coming from in this passage. That, that God has such a rich inheritance for them and he has a rich inheritance for us. And if we look back at the history, we get an idea of how he spent that time clearing that space and making that, that nation for him. Adam and Eve, we had the fall with Adam and Eve. They obviously turned away from God and they had to leave the garden. They lost their protective hedge, it was removed. They, that protection that had been put in place was no longer there and they had to work the land and they had to compete with thorns and thistles and everything else and sin and death had come into the world. But God starts to recover um, the situation with them. He covers them, covers their nakedness with skins to hide their shame and their nakedness and he begins to pro a process of re-establishing his kingdom on earth. And along the way, when he's doing that, he, at certain points, he has to reset the system in order that he can bring his people back to him. Because as people of God, we often become, we can become wayward. We can turn our backs on what he's put into place. So we had the flood and we have the fall of, of Babel or Babel, whichever you prefer. So this is a demonstration of God's love for his children, that he honours what he agreed in the first place. He honours the, the covenant he had with, with mankind. He doesn't turn his back on them. He um, doesn't destroy the earth and say, well, I'll start all over again. He actually tries to work for the people. At around 2000 BC, Abraham, Abraham came along and Abraham was called to establish a new nation under God to bring everyone back to him, to re-establish heaven on earth. And he eventually caught, had a son called Isaac, and Isaac had a son called Jacob. And then we, from that, we get the 12, tw 12, twice, the 12 tribes of Israel established. And from that, we get Joseph going into Egypt as a slave and becoming the second in command, and the nation of Israel being saved in Egypt from the famine. So I'm whizzing through this really quickly, I understand that, but I just want you to get an overall view of where we're coming from here. And then, of course, over time, the people of Israel became slaves to the Egyptians. And around 1300 BC, we have 
the children of Israel leaving in Exodus with Moses. And eventually we have the establishment of the promised land. Right, so now here we are in Isaiah 5, which is about 725 BC. So God has provided an amazing place for them, a land full of milk and honey. He's made established themselves as a nation where they were supposed to be in the first place. So he's put all this work into the nation and he comes back for the reward. Then he looked for the crop of grapes, but it yielded only bad fruit. So I was reading up about this and it takes about two years for the vineyard for a vineyard in the natural to mature and start producing grapes. And the harvest time comes, rotten grapes. They've gone off and they stink, the nation stinks. They completely corrupt. I was actually looking through the, the first four chapters and the depravity and the behavior of Israel was horrendous. Um, it talks about how they were still going through the process of sacrificing and doing all the things up front um, for, for God, but actually doing the opposite um, within, within their lives, within the, the vineyard as it was within the, the, the people. Um, so quite, and he was saying, I'd rather, you know, he'd rather have the obedience and, and everything else than all the sacrifice, which didn't actually amount to anything. So, from verse 3, now you dwellers in Jerusalem and people of Ju Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more could have been done for my vineyard than I have done for it? When I looked for good grapes, why did it yield only bad? Right. So who is to blame? God is asking you to decide who is to blame. Is it me or is it my creation for this crop disaster? I believe that people had a choice at this point that Isaiah has come along to, to warn the people. And we've seen with God that he, he will listen. People, people repent and turn back to him. Then he will spare them, spare them uh, judgment and, and some of the consequences of their actions. Okay. So, yeah, I think Jonah was a classic example because obviously God had compassion on Jonah and on the people of Nineveh and they were spared. So they had a choice. They have a choice in the situation as we have a choice in what we do when God calls us or brings us back to him. That we have a choice whether we turn our backs or we go back and repent and we, we, we start again with him and come close to him. So through Isaiah, they they could seek God's face and turn it around. I think uh, I was thinking back to when I worked in uh, a hostel some years ago. Um, we had a we we'd have court cases that would come up for people within within the place that it was inevitable, and you could guarantee they'd be going to the court all suited up and somebody else's suit, probably two sizes too big, uh, get their hair cut and do the, present the best they could before the court to to get as light a sentence or a, a light as punishment as they could to appear um that they they were a really nice person really and i was thinking back you know somebody that mary remember as well to a guy we <clears throat> a guy called mark he was a real cheeky chappy i uh, came from london he was an older guy and uh he was such a character such a nice guy he became a christian uh, during his time at the ymca I also where it was, that wasn't good, was it? Um, it was no big secret. What the YMCA, anyway, he um he became convicted of the fact that he'd robbed a motorbike from somebody or a moped some years before, and he felt that he had to uh, own up about it, which he did. Um, and he went to them and said, basically, yes, I, I stole the motorbike, it was me. Um, but the upshot was that no charges were pressed against him. And also the, they forgave him the, the money. He didn't have to pay any money back or anything because he went with repentant heart and just confessed. And it was just amazing. He was an amazing guy. 
So this is the, the situation. So they're in big trouble. Let's put on here. Dunk. Next picture coming up. Uh, right. There you go. There's Isaiah. Consequences. So we're going to go from verse five. Now I will tell you what I'm going to do to my vineyard. I will take away its hedge and it will be destroyed. I will break down its wall and it will be trampled. I will make it a wasteland, neither pruned nor cultivated, and briars and thorns will grow there. And I will command the clouds not to rain on it. So pretty severe consequences. So they have the hedge, which we've already talked about, which gave them protection. The hedge may gave protection from in, in the natural from animals and, and people, I guess, as well, coming into the, the garden and damaging the and damaging the, the vineyard. And so also the, the, the kind of in this in the Christian sense, it represents we could talk about the hedge of protection today as well where God protects us from um, demonic spiritual forces or even attacks from in the physical. <clears throat> and the whole consequence of here of the vineyard sounds to me a bit like the Garden of Eden, like we talked about earlier, where they wouldn't encounter the, the consequence of having to, to farm and, and grow things amongst the briars and the thorns, where things became really difficult and they hadn't got that protection of the garden. <clears throat> so it's a big consequence. <clears throat> Holton Lee, I go to Holton Lee once a week and uh, we do, do gardening. And they've got various gardens and plots of land there. And we do as we go through, we've been going through a process recently of digging out weeds and, and uprooting um, the plants that have died, preparing the ground. We get rid of the weeds and we take the weeds and at the back we've got this big, these two big hills where we dump all the weeds and they break down there and they don't harm the rest of the land. And I think there's a metaphor in there somewhere, isn't there? But the weeds get destroyed. <clears throat> so we turn the soil and we've been going through this process of putting cardboard over the dug ground and then putting wood chip on the top. So what happens is the cardboard stops the, the weeds coming through and it stops stuff coming up before we plant. And then the wood chip goes on top, but you can't, it takes time for the cardboard to break down and can become like a mulch with the ground once it gets wet. So when we dig it in, that, that's gonna be great. And it also keeps, we put wood chip on the top and that keeps the wood chip off the ground, which is slightly acidic at that time. And that has to break down a little bit before we can put the seeds in, otherwise it cooks the seeds or they get burnt by the acid. And then eventually, as, as the time goes by, the, the cardboard becomes part of the soil, we dig it all up and we can put seeds in. And then once we've done that, you, put, you can put poly tunnels over the top or we have like cages to protect them. The mice seem to like eating the bulbs and eating the flowers, but we, we do these things to protect them. So we go through all this process just to grow um, plants and things like that with, with the vegetables. I think we tend to use manure, which also has to be had time to break down before we plant. We don't want to have to dig all the weeds up all over again. It's a long process. It's a lot of effort. Actually, it's quite good working in teams because you actually get quite a lot done, um, quite a short space of time working in teams. But we work in teams and do these things and we plant vegetables and then we get to wait and see the crop which is great and see the flowers coming up so here we've got the situation as well with God and he's prepared all this time and I just wanted to give you an idea of the amount of work that goes in just for us doing that little plot of land and how much work God put into making the vineyard for those people and, for, and how patient he was and waiting to see the, the harvest so it says in verse 7, the vineyard of the Lord Almighty is the nation of Israel and the people of Judah are the vines he delighted in. He didn't just, he, see, it's not just love them, he delights in them as well. And he looked for justice, but saw bloodshed for righteousness, but heard cries of distress. 
So they had gone completely wrong. They'd gone completely crazy with what they behaved. Their behaviour didn't match what the expectation of the, the work and the planting and the process had been through. And looking at this, I've, I really felt that this sounds very much like where we are today. As I read out the the, the sentence and, and what happened and, and everything else, you begin to understand it, it really kind of relates to where we are today. Okay, that's a sentence. So <clears throat> this is the this is the, the areas in which they have really um, failed in. It's like a, it's like the the prosecution's accusations. We've already been told that to judge between me and my people. And God gives a clear explanation through Isaiah about this. I don't know if you can imagine this as a song, but it'd been quite interesting to hear it sung, wouldn't it? So, woe to you, this is verse eight, but woe to you who, had a, who add house to house and join field to field till no space is left. And you live alone in the land. The Lord Almighty has declared in my hearing, surely the great houses will become desolate, the fine mansions left without occupants. A 10 acre vineyard will produce only a bath of wine. A homer of seed will yield only an ether of grain. So, so these are serious things, serious charges. And the punishment might seem severe, but they, they, they basically, the things that they're suffering are going to suffer. The things he's talking about here uh, are already happening. They're starting to happen already, and the, the 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 response or the judgment is actually self-inflicted. Their productions become diminished, and everyone suffers from the greed of the leaders and for those with power. God had actually put protection in place uh, through Moses and, and various times to protect the, the poor and the vulnerable, the widows, widows and the orphans, and all the rest of it. But they're being overridden, overridden by the greed of others. Greed is a real problem. And I think within our society now, it's a real problem where we, we take our eyes off God and we just think, start thinking about our own our own personal needs at the expense of others. We have um, addictions popping up as well. Woe to those who rise early in the morning to run after the, their drinks, who stay up late at night till they are inflamed with wine. Uh, I just thought this is, this is so much, what's coming up now is so much in verse 12, so much about uh, our culture that you can relate to this, like with the whole going out clubbing, etc., etc. They have harps and lyres at their banquets, pipes and timbrels and wine, and they have no regard for the needs of the Lord, no respect for the work of his hands. Therefore, my people will go into exile for lack of understanding. Those of high rank will die of hunger, and the common people will be parched with thirst. Therefore, death expands its jaws, open wide, opening wide its mouth, into, into it will descend their nobles and their masses with all their brawlers and revelers. So people will be brought low and everyone humbled, the eyes of the arrogant humbled, but the Lord Almighty will be exalted by his justice and the holy God will be proved holy by his righteous acts. Then sheep will graze as in their own pasture, lambs will feed among the ruins of the rich. So it's a great falling away of those of power. It's a great judgment upon them. There's no understanding here of right and wrong. So in verse 20, woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. We live in a society where even our language uh, contradicts itself you know calling one thing another thing like um i was just thinking back to uh, michael jackson when he sang bad which meant good or when we have a generation that says sick means it's great it's good so 
we we do within our society often we confuse what is right and what is real and what isn't um so we can continue on here woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and clever in their own sight woe to those who are heroes at drinking wine and champion champions at mixing drinks wow it's like it's just so interesting it's like when people go out drinking and and do shots and everything else you know we think that we you know in our society we have something that's completely new uh and i think when you think about solomon and, and ecclesiastes where he said there's nothing new under the sun and there is nothing new under the sun but each generation comes through and thinks they've invented it but this is actually uh moving away from god's plan and what god has for us um so yeah worse those who are heroes at drinking wine and champions at mixing drinks who acquit the guilty for a, a bribe but deny justice for the innocent to the innocent it's where everything you know we're talking about here god judging the nation but they within their own their own people they're not they're not using uh justice correctly they're not um running the courts properly they're not um being right in the way they do things so the sentence is basically can be death for some people exile and captivity so from 24 therefore as tongues of fire lick up straw and as light dry grass sinks down into, in the flames so their roots will decay and their flowers blow away like dust for they have rejected the law of the Lord Almighty and spurned the world of the Holy One of Israel. So, pretty serious situation. But as we'll see, God actually comes back to the people. He doesn't just leave and abandon them. He, doesn't, he won't leave and abandon us. He'll do his utmost in order to um, draw alongside um, his, his children he'll do his utmost to draw alongside you this morning you know you may think you've done all, really some really bad stuff but God will still come back to you he'll still he still offers a, an opportunity to for redemption and for um, coming back into into back to relationship with him so things may look really dire and there may be consequences to actions but God still loves us he goes out of his way constantly to bring us back to him and that's what he's what he does here um the exile seems really you know it seems really bad that they're going to go they're going to fall in slavery and everything else but he's pre-warned them quite a long time ahead of time um and the exile comes around 600 bc so yeah they have plenty of time to turn it around and they didn't do it they didn't listen to what they were told so 70 years in exile um, and then restoration came back around around 500 BC, so it's about 70 years in exile. Um, it makes me it makes me think about how uh, after the war um, Israel was reformed and how within a day of um, with voting in the United Nations, I think it was, they were given back the land. Um, and the Bible says, "Could a nation be one uh, one in a day?" Um, and they were rescued in a day. They can be made in a day. They were rescued um, and given the land back. And uh, it's just amazing what God can do. So yeah, they they were restored back around 500 BC. So I was thinking back to the Adele song. It says, "I hoped you'd see my face and that you'd be reminded that for me it isn't over, because God doesn't forget. He does not forget us, and He'll." he'll keep coming back to a point as long as he can he'll keep coming back um, to save us from the situation and he same with israel so <clears throat> application for today okay application for today uh, that's how i see isaiah today riding a motorbike i don't know why who knows but there you are that's the drawing so i want you to turn to matthew 21 verse 33 because we're going to do a comparison here between um isaiah 5 and new testament when 
Christ tells the parable of the tenants. So that's Matthew 21, 33. Now they're both obviously about vineyards, but this takes it from a slightly different angle and brings us up to date. Um, it's amazing what you can learn if you look back um, from the New Testament. People, I think sometimes people rule out the Old Testament and just look at the New, but you, they're not separate books. They're actually part of the same message. You can actually gain things when you go back to the Old Testament and then compare the two because it actually puts more definition into what was said or puts a slightly different spin on what's been said previously. So, so Matthew 21, verse 33. Listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard. He put a wall around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Sound familiar? Then he rented the vineyard to the same, to some, not the same farm, to some farm, farmers and moved to another place. When the harvest time approached, he sent his servants to the tenants to collect his fruit. So we've got a similar story up to that point, haven't we? The tenants seized his servants. They beat one, killed another, and stoned a third. And then he sent other servants to them more than the first time, and the tenants treated them the same way. So we, here we have like the prophets coming through. So one of those servants would have been obviously Isaiah. He had other various ones. He obviously had Moses and people like that. All these people that had gone through, people that had warned and 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 guided the people. <clears throat> but last of all, he sent his son to them. They will respect my son, he said. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to each other, this is the heir. Come, let's kill him and take his inheritance. So they took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? He will bring those, he will bring those wretches to a wretched end, they replied, and he will rent the vineyard to other tenants who will give him his share of the crop at harvest time. So this, this is about... Uh, People, uh, having a different people which includes us and I think also a redeemed Israel to uh, in the future to reap the harvest it's it's he he couldn't trust those other guys but he's got these other he's got us coming through I'm not saying we replace I'm not saying we replace but I'm saying we'll be part of that new um we're part of that new uh people in the vineyard I think I've made that, I hope I made that clear. So, so Jesus said to them, have you never read in the scriptures, the, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and the Lord has done this and this is marvelous in our eyes. There I feel, therefore I tell you that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people who, who will produce its fruit. Anyone who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces. Anyone on whom it falls will be crushed. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard Jesus' parables, they knew he was talking about them. They looked for a way to arrest him, but they were afraid of the crowd because the people held that he was a prophet. So this passage is a reenactment of, of Isaiah 5 in many ways, from a different angle, as I said. It reveals God's love, patience and provision for his children and his purposes for the world. Satan has obviously tried to hijack the things that God's done. And we've seen here that um, good is substituted for evil, etc. This is a battle that we go through. This is a narrative throughout the Bible. And it's a narrative for now as well. It's a place where we go through. We're constantly fighting against Satan and moving forward and drawing close to God. That's how we move forward. Um, so it's a constant tug of war. It's a choice about whether we seek God's face or do what feels right to us or do doing what you feels right to you it's it's about trusting him obviously jesus has mentioned himself in the parable he is prophesying his death and his resurrection and the establishment of the new people under god's authority and love 
The reason that the people were taken into exile is because of God's love. The punishment enabled the possibility of rehabilitation and the restoration of his people. So, as God's people, how do we respond? What can we learn from the two parables? We have to trust God and his plans and his narrative. This is a love song and God really loves you. So, the fruit we pr produce depends on who and what we follow, who and what you follow. So I wasn't sure how really to end this, but I'm kind of covering it, but I was looking at Galatians 5, 22 and 23, and that talks about um, the fruit that we should produce. And these are the, basically the, the outworking of our productiveness and uh, our um relationship with us we can see that through um the fruit which we produce which is love joy patient patience kindness goodness faithfulness gentleness and self-control and it's quite interesting looking through those i struggle with some of those sometimes especially patience <laughs> and also sometimes kindness but these are the things that we should aspire to we should be um we should be God's representatives on earth as Christians. We have a rich inheritance that we've seen through throughout the Bible and through Isaiah 5. We've seen that God wants the best, even if we can't always see it. He wants you to live an abundant life and he wants you to produce good fruit. He, you know, if you don't follow him, that's when we start faltering and we produce less. We become less productive. And, and and less um less 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 of him and more of ourselves so he wants to have abundant life and he wants to keep us under the shadow of his wings he wants to, he puts that hedge of protection around us he keeps us under the shadow of his wings as it says in um psalms 91 he he has invested in your future and even allowing his son to die on the cross for us so we could be reunited with him. Your choice is whether you return that love or chase after the pleasures of this world. It's your choice. As, as we see in this passage, you can't, we can't blame others for our shortcomings. We have to take responsibility for our own actions. Ignorance within the law is no defence, and often you hear people criticise that may criticise their leaders or their pastors or whatever. But actually, we have a responsibility ourselves. We need to really focus on drawing close to God and listening to what He's saying to us individually, as well as as a as a um, as the bride as a whole. So the harvest have we invested in the harvest that's coming are we are we invested in it have we put anything into it do we just go through the motions like they did in um isaiah uh, one to four when they talk when god talks about how they just do meaningless sacrifices do we go to church um and go through all the motions but actually don't live the life that god has called us to is going to church or doing those things is it just uh, a social club or a, a, a kind of formality because god really wants to draw close to us now this screen behind me is two two um, pieces of artwork which are on large canvases behind there is things like all the kitchen area that we have in our flat but that screen hides it but god sees behind the screen with us you know, we can put all sorts of masks up and hide behind them, but actually God sees. And it's our opportunity. I feel that reading this patch, it's our opportunity to actually turn to him and say, right, let's come back for you. Let's spend, let's spend time together. Let's just chill out together. Let's sit on the sofa together and just spend time being with each other. That's how our relationship with God should be. It's, it's not always... Um, it's not always kind of just worshiping, which is good. It's not always reading our Bible. It's actually just spending time just being, just being in his presence and being with him. So uh, I just finished, I just thought I'd finish with 
uh, last lyric of um, Adele's song, which is sometimes it lasts in love, but sometimes it hurts instead. It's up, up to us whether we seek God and seek to follow him and do his will or to turn our backs because that's not a good option. So that's the message for this morning. I hope it was uh, comprehensible and uh, I wait for your feedback. Thanks very much for listening.